Uh, I was at an I.O. the I.O. conference in San Francisco earlier this year, and they had a whole lot of HTML5 talks, and I came back very, very, very excited about some of the things that I heard about. Um, there was just all kinds of new stuff happening in the browser. We're like, it seems like we spent a long time as web developers getting browsers to be sort of on par with each other and remove as much suck as possible <laughs> from our development environment. And what, I, what I'm seeing now is we're really plowing forward and just doing things I wouldn't have even thought we could be doing in the browser. And a lot of that is coming through Google and Chrome and soon to be in a browser near here. So without further ado, awesome. thank you very much. Thank you guys very much for having me. It's kind of cool and exciting to be here. Um, when I was thinking about what to really talk about today, uh, the original thinking was, okay, like there's lots of cool HTML5 stuff, but I kind of thought you guys might have already started playing with it. You know, might have already seen some of the cool stuff. So what's the new stuff? So just out of curiosity, how many people have, have dived in reasonably well into HTML5, you're building stuff today? Okay, so about, about half the folks. So I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff today that is the stuff that you can't really play with today. You can't play with tomorrow. You might be able to play with it in a couple months. But it's stuff that's coming up within the next couple of months. It's stuff that still, if you play with it today, it may not work tomorrow, right? Like as, as the new browsers shift, as, as the specs change. These things aren't quite ready for the real world yet. So, I'm going to talk about a couple of the new semantic elements, uh, some of the new JavaScript APIs, some of the richer integration that gives us better access to the hardware in our machines and, and uh, some performance stuff, uh, and then the devices. So I'll jump into semantics right off the bat. This is a really neat one, uh, the details um, element. It's kind of funky because it allows you to get that um, sort of have stuff open and close really easily. So I've got the details element. You can see here I say details, open equals open. You provide a summary and then some content, and you end up with something that looks like this, right? Or if you wanted to do this in the past, you had to depend on some kind of library, or maybe you were going to go and use just a bunch of JavaScript and, and write it yourself, right? Where you just go and say, well, I'm going to go hide this element. When you click on it, I'm going to show it when you don't. Now all that is built into HTML as an element, so you don't actually have to go and do any of the crazy that you had to do in the past. Um, output is another new one. Basically go and, and fire results based on what's going on. So I've got a range element here. That as I move this guy around, I can see what the output of this range is. So I can see, hey, result value, value is a number, and I just add the two. And sure enough, as I go and I start, do, you know, you can actually get in real time with almost no JavaScript written, all of the results from different inputs going up together. So it's a nice, easy way to be able to get access to some of the stuff you haven't been able to do before. Everybody seen Bacon Ipsum or Developer Ipsum? Yeah. Another fun, <laughs> dorky one, right? Like. Okay, well, maybe bacon it some is an HTML5, but um, so the mark tag, right? So if you've got elements that you want to go and highlight, right? Think of when you go to a search, you end up on some web page, and it highlights your key search terms. You could do those yourself with a span, or maybe you're going to wrap it in a div or something like that. But there's no semantic meaning to that, right? There's no, there's nothing for the browser to really know about accessibility doesn't help in accessibility at all. So all you have to do is just add an open mark and close mark tag around the words that you want. I've gone and styled them a little bit so we get some pretty colors and that kind of stuff, but you can style them however you want. So I just added some uh, blue and, and uh, red, just depending on what, uh, which one you're on. We showed this at, at Google I.O. I've showed this one a bunch of times. This is one of my favorite ones, especially to demo live, only because a live demo of any kind of speech input um, always gets a little bit fun. Let me just actually make sure I have a 
good network connection. All right. So you can add this on any element today. And this is actually one I tell a lot of folks, like if you've got a search box or you've got something on your page and you want to go do it, like add this today because if it doesn't work, nobody's going to notice, right? Like they're not going to see that uh, speech input box. But if they do, they're going to be like pleasantly surprised. <laughs> so <laughs> go click on this. The rain in Spain. I like that because it's kind of fun. It's a little complex. And so sure enough, you know, you get the rain in Spain. So it just takes your voice, it, it sends it up to the cloud, figures out what you said, sends it down, sticks it in. Did the same demo with one of my coworkers a couple of months ago. And uh, he's from Spain, so he's got a very thick Spanish accent. And I'll, sh I'll show you something here. So there's a set of APIs that will also give you all of the things that that person possibly could have said, right? So you can go through and see what else they might have said if it really isn't sure. So it's got a confidence level of 93, 90, almost 94% that I said the rain in Spain, right? Ah, it did it to me. Third one down. The way to S star 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 star, <laughs> right? Like, Unfortunately, it won't give you the fun words, but you can, you can get an idea. So you can see if the person says something where you're not quite sure that they said what you're looking for if you're trying to do a search. Maybe you're trying to do some kind of training application where they have to go and say something. So they're maybe doing radio training. You know, car one to car two. Is it what you expect? Yes, yay, you can use that. Is it not? Okay, well, is it close? Maybe they were mumbling. So there's a bunch of really neat things that you can do with this. Mobile devices, right? Like you want to put this on a mobile web app, great. You now can do speech input just like you can on your phone on, in the browser. So JavaScript APIs, here's one that I think is fantastic. How many people use jQuery or something, some other library in their stuff? Yeah, pretty much almost every hand goes up, right? jQuery is just one of those things that everybody uses every day. But one of the things I tend to use it for is adding and removing classes. Wouldn't it be nice if instead of having to use jQuery to go do that, you could actually go in and say, hey, I want to do this. So document query selectors. Query selectors are just another new HTML5 piece. And it just does a, a query selector and, and gets the first element that matches that particular uh, uh, CSS query, right? And then I say dot class list. And class list gives me all of the classes that are on that attribute. Now I can do dot add, I can do dot remove, and I can do dot toggle, right? So by doing dot add, I don't have to worry about putting spaces in, I don't have to worry about making sure everything's like, you know, properly quoted. I don't have to worry about that if I'm gonna do it manually because maybe I don't want to put jQuery on my page for whatever reason. So I can go in and just use add, remove, and toggle, and sure enough, nice and easily, I'm able to get all of the, the styles and stuff that I want to get without having to do anything just crazy or, or rely on libraries. Data set is another one, right? Like if you're trying to store data on elements, easy way to do that, jQuery or some other library, but if you don't want to go that far, you can actually go and use the HTML5 specs, right? Actually, this one is fairly well supported right now. You can use this in, in a lot of browsers. If you can't, you can usually fall back to a bunch of libraries without too much trouble. So you can go in and say, hey, data ID, good, right? Data name, Joe, and data screen name, user one, right? So then as we go through and get our, our keys, um, back from the elements, if you ask for data ID, it's not going to give you the ID of the element. It'll give you the ID that's associated with data dash ID, right? Um, so name, obviously, is coming from data name. Interestingly, it gets camel cased if you use hyphens in there, right? So we go from screen hyphen name to screen camel case name. Right? Um, match selector. So you can check to see if a particular element, again, these replace a lot of uh, the things that you would have used in libraries and stuff like that. 
So now you can say, hey, I want to say, does this element match a particular selector? So you can say, hey, is the data type a tweet? Yes, it is. Okay, great. I want to go in and do something in particular with this. Maybe I want to go back and use that class list and add a class. Or I want to go and do any particular things uh, that way. <coughs> match media, um, form factor detection, right? Everybody's familiar with, with uh, media queries and CSS where you can say, hey, I want to go and, and apply this particular style, but we don't have an easy way that we can do that with JavaScript. So with this, we can actually do it with JavaScript. I can get resize my window down, and it, sure enough, it changes to be um, on an iPad or on a tablet. I can keep going down, and it'll eventually go to um, a phone. So you don't have to think about, oh, okay, well, I need to do this, I need to do this. Oh, well, I just, I'm going to listen for screen resize events, right? Because listening for screen resize events can get to be a bit of a pain. You can go and just very quickly apply anything based on the CSS style, or the CSS uh, media queries. All right. How many people have tried to do any kind of cryptography or like random number generation with, with JavaScript? Yeah, like a couple people. It's one of those ones you just can't really do easily because there is no random number, true random number generator in JavaScript until now. So now I can get a cryptographically strong random number seeded through the OS, right? So the OS is going to go and, and do that crazy stuff. If the OS can't provide it back to me, um, I'm going to get a, a not supported error, right? So maybe your, your device, for whatever reason, isn't able to generate that particular random number. So you'll get uh, not supported. But sure enough, you can get go. And I can click on this for, for hours and hours and hours and days. This is actually a, a real set of random numbers. So if you do need something for whatever your application, whether it's cryptography, maybe you want to make sure that you do have a good set of things going, you've got this uh, window.crypto. Um, I, so I had never seen uh, CoffeeScript until tonight. Um, and I got to say, I'm not a huge JavaScript fan. Like, I much prefer to do design stuff, but I'm not very good at it. I like CoffeeScript a lot, but this is one of these things. Window on error makes my life much easier, and I think makes for a better experience for a lot of our users who are coming onto our websites, right? Because maybe they're sitting on something and, and oops, well, your coworker, because it would never be us who would introduce a JavaScript bug or any kind of bug, right? Like, we're all good enough that it's always that person sitting next to us. Um, well, if that's the case, you want to be able to catch those errors before somebody sees them, right? You don't want that, hey, this thing just failed or, or whatever just gone on. Well, the other cool thing is when you do catch those messages, you can use analytics. Maybe you use an XML HTTP request, and you can send those back so that you know when errors are happening, you can figure out what's going on with your code on remote machines, right? So that you don't have to go, oh, well, everything seems to be working because we're not hearing anything from our users and, and they seem to be going strong. Well, nobody's actually getting past, you know, maybe the third page or whatever the case is, but they're not telling you about it. So with this, I can go make a boo boo, and sure enough, I, now, you know, I'm, I, this is a kind of lame example here, but I just popped up an alert that says, hey, uncaught reference exception, awesome undefined function that blows up my app is not defined. There's a surprise, right? Um, so it means that you can catch those errors much more easily. You don't have to worry about what's going on, where things are, are breaking, or, or, why, or why they're breaking. All right. Uh-oh. Or that function can kill your, your presentation. <laughs> All right, let's pop back over. There. How many people have tried?
tried to do any kind of binary data stuff on uh, uh, in JavaScript. Yeah, um, so to the three of you guys, you, you rock, right? Like, it's not easy, right? It's probably one of those things where you had to encode stuff, you had to deal with this and that. You want to do any kind of image manipulation, you want to do any kind of audio manipulation or, or transfer audio data, it's just not something that's really easy to do. So one of the new things that's come online, and this is actually something you can play with reasonably well today, is typed arrays. Basically gives you an array of a specific type so that when you put information or data into that set of, of arrays, you know what it is, right? So it's either an, an int, an 8-bit int, maybe it's a 16, 32, whatever the case is. What this is really, really useful for is doing any kind of WebGL work. So if you're doing any kind of WebGL where you're manipulating graphics and you've got to deal with any kind of crazy you know, image manipulation, you really want to have a strongly typed set of, of data that you can then go and use. So with typed arrays, you can go through and actually go do that. It makes things a lot easier. I'm going to show you an example of a, a place where we use that in an app that we built um, that's kind of fun. Um, spell check APIs. Chrome has it today, so like you know, you're you're going through, you're typing up a blog post, or maybe you're you're doing something and you spell something wrong, and you get the little squig squiggly line, right? That's great, but sometimes there are words that we just aren't in our dictionary that you might use on a regular basis, or your users might use on a regular basis. So with the spell check API, you can actually add new words to the dictionary, so that as the user's going and typing in. You can provide both those words and suggestions for what the cor correct thing to do is. Right? So I've got here where, well, we spelled chromium with a W, so you can go and, and provide a couple options back for what these guys are. So this is, this is one of these ones. Right now it's like way, way, way early in, in spec. It's only available in chromium nightly builds. Right, so this is not something you really want to start playing with probably at this point, but it's something to go give a shot and have a look at because really this is the time for us as web developers to provide the right set of feedback to the W3C and to all the working groups so that they can go, hey, yeah, this works, maybe this doesn't work, or maybe we want to have a different set of APIs, right? Like, where are we going to go and, and use these particular things? The page visibility API. How many people check to see how many people's uh, websites depend somewhat on ads? All right. <laughs> so about a, about a quarter to a third, right? That's actually kind of important, right? If people are opening your pages and looking at them, you want to know because that obviously has some really interesting thing, interesting implications. They're opening them, not looking at them. Your ads aren't getting seen, and, and your advertisers aren't going to be very happy. They're not going to be clicking on stuff. Well, as well, it's really interesting to know, hey, how long are people staying around on my page? Right? If I open a page and go look at it, spend three seconds there, and go, oh, this is crappy. I don't want to be here. Go somewhere else. Right? I want to know what the quality of my application is, what the quality of my data is. Another example. You've got a video running on a page, YouTube maybe. So I go look at the video, but for whatever reason, I need to switch to another tab. It'd be really nice if the video would pause for me automatically, so I didn't have to go click the pause button, go switch over to something else, and then come back and hit play again. So with the page visibility API, there's uh, two events that get fired. So when the page shows is visible, you can go see something, and when it's not, so I'm going to pop over here for a sec, and, and you know, whatever, we're just looking at, at Google. Sure enough, we fire the event, we say page hidden is true, and the state is hidden, and then afterwards we say hidden is false, and we set the page state back to visible. So you can actually keep track of how long the person's uh, able to see your page, how long they're on your page, and all of that kind of stuff. This one becomes really interesting because of this next piece. How many people heard about the pre-rendering 
um, announcement that Google made a little while ago. So a couple of folks. Pre-rendering allows you as a developer to say, you know, I'm pretty confident that when somebody comes to my page, they're going to click on this link, right? It's one of those things. Maybe the, the um, it's a, a particular news article. Maybe it's a set of content that they're always coming and, and looking at. So with the pre-render, you add the rel equals pre-render. And what that's going to do, so I'll just type in uh, NY talk. <laughs> Whoa. All right. So we we've been. Um, What's the key to undo that? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. So we've been playing with our new uh, slide deck, and uh, obviously there's a bug or two in it. Of course, I you know I ran through this like three or four times earlier today. Do you think any of these things happened earlier today? Yeah. Um. All right. Here's what we're going to do. Kill it. Uh, that was what I wanted. Here's what I want. All right. So instead of actually showing you guys the, the close HTML tag at the end, which I have anyways, but here's my presentation, all done in HTML. Um, so we'll just go down and uh, fine, pre-render, all right, so pre plot. so we're just going to go copy this. All right, all right. Don't, don't take care of our presentation. So, all right, so here we go. Uh, I'll go do nytimes.com, and I click pre-render, and so it says now click to, uh, click to navigate. What Chrome's done under the covers has gone and started downloading all of the entire New York Times website so that when I click this, it's Woo! loaded pretty much instantly. Right now, if I were to try this over here and just go to nytimes.com, <laughs> right, it's fast, but it's not that fast. Right now, here's the other really good one to do because this one isn't quite as fast, and hopefully I won't get this one. Because <laughs> these guys aren't quite as fast in rendering, and if anybody here is from this company, I apologize to you now, right? Look at how fast that came up. Try the same thing over here. Uh, helps if I type in the right URL. Not quite as fast, again. So what's happening behind the covers is Chrome goes and says, hey, I'm just going to go download this stuff for you, and I'm going to just make sure it's already rendered. I'm good to go. Now, this can potentially cause a bit of a performance problem, right? Because if you, ca if you have it, um, eh, there we go. If you have it pre-rendered too many pages, all of a sudden, you're like you're eating up the entire user's bandwidth. Question back there. So for the pages that depend on ads for money, how does that avoid um, you know big fodder or, or those type of issues? Yeah. So right now, this is only available in Chromium nightly builds, right? Um, and I think what's going to have to happen is uh, in those ads that you're putting on your pages when you're getting them from ad networks, they're going to have to use the page visibility API to see. Is this page actually visible or not? Has the user actually gone and clicked on a page and opened a tab and gone to visit it? Or have they just pre-rendered it? So, question there? Interaction of pre oh, visibility and pre-render. I presume you fire the hidden event. Yes. I, you know, I believe it's the hidden event is fired first, um, so that way things, or the state Right off the bat, I'm asking the question because we have two new features that are probably being implemented by separate teams. Follow up with me, and, and we'll oh, give it a shot. Later. Yeah. Do, um, do, you, do you know if the request gets sent with a special header or something? So that I don't believe it does today. Oh. Um, but you know, it's still an early thing, so it's definitely worth worth you know providing that feedback. Yeah. What blocks pages? pre-renders that you're pre-rendering? Um, the fact that you guys are all good people. <laughs> right? 
So right now there's nothing to block this. This is part of the reason why it's only in the, the Chromium Nightlies and, and in some of the, the Chrome developer channels. Um, because you can actually cause some pretty serious pain to somebody's computer if you really wanted to. We will probably make sure that we'll find some way to make sure that that doesn't happen, but I don't know what that's going to look like today or tomorrow. Um, tonight. Tonight. Somewhere in there. Um, Navigator.online is a really interesting method that, or event that gets fired. It tells you when, the, the, when there is a sort of network connection. Now, I say sort of network connection because as long as the computer thinks it's connected to a network, it doesn't actually have to have an internet connection or a network connection. As long as it's connected to a network, it's going to think it's online. If we lose that network connection, right? So I'm going to go and turn my wireless off. Sure enough, I'm offline, right? So no network connection. And connection is flaky. We'll go back, we'll connect. And we get the online event fire. Now, here's the problem. We could probably go here and we'll just go, right? Okay, so I still have that connection that I had from earlier, but if you don't have a, a true network connection, you still get the online thing firing. So that, this event is particularly good if somebody's, if you're maybe um, on a mobile device if you want to check for, hey, what's going on with the network connection? If you know you're going to be in a sort of connected state, this is a really good way to say, hey, let's just check first step, and then we can go and make our connections afterwards. Because if you know you're offline, then start storing stuff to the local data store, right? Use web storage, something like local storage, or uh, if it's much more complex data, maybe you're going to use index DB. But store the user's data locally, so that way when they come online later, you can put it back online and they're not losing any of the information, any of the data, anything that they were doing when they first started using your app. Um, actually, I'm going to undo this for a sec. Pasting files. How many people have been trying to deal with any kind of file input, like they drag files onto their, into their app, you upload files, that kind of stuff? You know. One of the really nice things that would be cool to be able to do is say copy, go back into here, and just hit Command V and paste a file right into the document without having to go through and do anything crazy. So all I did here was go through and say, listen for the on paste event, right? And go through and grab the data off the clipboard. And in this particular case, I'm just using a, a blob to store that data, and I can put that right on the page just using an image. So now I can upload stuff, I can do all sorts of cool, crazy stuff with it without having to go through and say, all right, the user has to file upload every single individual file that they want, right? Like, you know, you go to a picture site, a photo site, and it says, hey, go upload all these files because you want to upload the, the photos from your, your son's birthday, maybe your sister's birthday, whatever the case is, right? You got to use Flash or there's some kind of plugin to get all those files up easily. Well, so this is one way. There's another one that you can use. Um, with WebKit on a file input, you can put WebKit directory and it'll upload everything in an entire directory. So you just point it at a directory instead of a, a bunch of files and it'll upload those. So that's a really cool new one that's coming on. Um, custom protocol handlers. So if you actually want to register your own uh, set of events, right? So you want the browser to actually handle mail to and send it to Gmail, Hotmail, whatever you mail <coughs> you use. You can actually now do this with the register protocol handler. So you basically go and say, hey, I'm going to register this app. And the app comes up just like you would for anything else when you're going to take over something in, in the user's browser. We want to make sure that they are really legitimately doing what they think they're doing. So, hey, this is going to go and say, hey, use my app. Sure enough. Now, th this is the exact expected behavior, but I get handler 
which is what I told it to go use, and it goes and does that. So if I go into my preferences under the hood, and in content settings, I can actually see where all the handlers are, and I can see where applications are being dealt with. So I can point iCal events at you know, my calendar. I don't have to have them go and, and go to some off weird, crazy place. All right. Oh, I closed my slides again. I'm not having a good day with slides. All right, here we go. Another way we have to. And of course, these slides are all online, and um, hopefully they won't cause as many problems for you guys. Cross my fingers. All right. Device access, uh, web audio API. How many people have played with the web audio API? A couple, a couple of folks? Web audio API is one of those new, kind of cool, kind of fun ones that you can go play with. The audio element has a couple of problems, right? It's good if you just want to do a single sound or like you just want to play a song, you just want to run a, a single audio track. But if you want to have maybe a game that a sound fires at a specific time under a specific case, you want to layer multiple songs or multiple sounds over top of each other, the audio tag doesn't do that. With the web audio API, you can do that. So I can go and click, hey, I'm going to say shoot, bang, you know, great. I want to do it on a two second delay. So I'll click stop, two second delay, two seconds. So you can say, hey, I want something to happen. You want it to keep continuously happening, right? You can go and do it that way. So we actually did uh, a couple neat ones. If you saw Google I.O., we showed this demo. Um, so I'm just going to turn this down a little bit. So one of the things that you can do with the Web Audio API is that you can get the uh, data so that you can create visualizers. Another thing that you can't do with, with the audio tag, right? So, okay, kind of cool, you know. But wouldn't it be neat if you could, with SVG, and, and modify the DOM a little bit, start changing it around? So now we've got multiple colors. Maybe an HTML5 logo, right? Maybe use uh, CSS 3D rotations and <laughs> rotate it around, all right? <laughs> Maybe you do the Chrome logo and spin that guy around a little bit, right? And of course, no party would be complete without Bug Droid. And when he likes his music, he likes a little bit of his pump action. <laughs> so one of the things that I really love about my job is we get to go and play with this stuff on a, on a real regular basis. Um, and so. I'm going to show you this. I'm going to get out of uh, this version of Chrome, because right now it only works um, in Chrome 13. But we decided we wanted to try and experiment with building uh, a sort of similar app to Turntable FM, if you're familiar with that. Uh, but do it all open source. We didn't want to depend on um, Flash, Silver, like we, we wanted it pure open source. And so we sat down and we basically used all of the stuff that I've talked about today, including uh, we used some web sockets, we used um, the, the web audio API, so that as I go, and let me just sort of drag, I've got a song over here somewhere, here we go. So I drag this song, drag and drop files into an application. Uh, is my server running? Um, Sure enough, we did this with, with Node. So let me just try and re restart this. So we did this with Node uh, as our back end because we wanted to, to experiment with Node a little bit. So I drag my file in. Hopefully, I will get this going. There we go. All right, so starting song. Sure enough, we've got a visualizer. We've got um, my little guy isn't dancing, but I can move him around. Oh, there we go. So you've got your little animated guy who's moving around, dancing to the music. He's actually dancing to the beat, or she, or whatever the five is, um, is dancing to the beat of the song. We've got a chat application running with, uh, with Node as our, our server backend. Um, this took us about 
To get it to this stage, it was probably about three and a half days of work, but we had an implementation running within the first, probably, day. We had everything working. So it's really cool, the stuff that you can do with, um, and I'm just going to get out of this because we don't really need to keep hearing that song. But um, you can see like what you're able to do with HTML5 and like the web audio API to do the visualizers, to, to get the, the little guy moving to the beat, all that kind of stuff. All right. Um, this one is, is coming online. This one's probably a little bit further away. Full screen API, right? Being able to have the entire app go full screen. Um, video, terribly useful for stuff like that. And this one, I think is implemented today in some of the Chromium Nightly builds, but you have to go enable it. It's worth just going and having a look at, um, because I think this will be, be really interesting as it comes, comes along. Um, device access, right? Being able to get access to the camera, to the microphone. You saw get me get access to the microphone earlier to, to do the speech input. Well, unfortunately, you can't actually get that text or get the audio of what the user said. Kind of silly, I know, because it's just doing the recording. It should be able to spit it right out to you if you want it. Um, but you can't do that. Um, and in fact, you can't automate the, the clicking of that button. <laughs> the user has to do it. Understandably, a little security thing if it, you know you had your app start recording on the user without them knowing it. But um, this will be coming probably in the next three to six months, I would say. We'll see it an implementation. Opera's already done a demo of this where they give you access to your web, to your camera, and you can see what's going on, and they send that back, they can send that back out through the pipe. So it's a kind of neat one to be able to think about, you know, real-time communication. If you're familiar, there's a new working group, the WebRTC working group, which is basically going to build real-time communication, audio, video, and, and chat stuff into the browser, so we don't have to use third-party applications to do that. We can just do it straight in within our browser. Um, how many people are familiar with polyfills? All right, uh, only a couple of folks. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Wrong pipe. <coughs> All right, <coughs> I'll try this. <coughs> <coughs> All right, there we go, that's a little better. How many people have ever rented a place and you put a picture on the wall or you put a hole in the wall and um, the landlord is coming in to do your inspection tomorrow and you're like, ah, crap, I gotta fill that hole because I don't wanna spend, I don't wanna pay my landlord a lot of money for that little hole. So what do you do? You take some flour and water and you mix it together and you put it in and then you take a little bit of white out and you cover it over <laughs> and it looks perfect like nobody's ever gonna notice, right? The real brand of that product that you go and buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever is called polyfill, all right? Basically it goes and fills the holes so you don't have to deal with like spending a lot of money or dealing with a lot of crap. There's a whole bunch of polyfills that are available to do exactly that for the code that we write, which means that it's going to go and implement things in browsers that don't support it, or it's going to go and make our lives easier because it's going to take implementations that are done a little bit different in each of the browsers, and it's going to standardize them so that they all work the same. So as you guys are, are going through and, and looking, Go have a look at polyfills. You can, easiest way to find them, just go do a search for HTML5 space polyfill, and there's a fantastic list of them. Um, and, you know, I'll let you figure out what they're, they're called, because, you, you know, I won't say that up here, but ask me later. Um, there's all <laughs> sorts of really great ones, like if you want to get SVG into like IE7, right? You can do it. You want to go get Canvas into, uh, a browser that doesn't support it, you can do it. Web storage, um, video. So there's all kinds of these polyfills that are available, and some of them will even go and add stuff that nobody's implemented yet. Uh, if you're familiar with Flexbox model, it's a new CSS3 layout system. Somebody's written in JavaScript, which is awesome, because we can just go use that, and we, can, we don't have to worry about uh, no implementation uh, for a little while. Chrome status 
If you're curious whether something's been implemented in Chrome yet, chromestatus.com is your place to go. You can go hit that site and keep it up to date all the time. And we'll also go back and tell you when something got implemented. So if you want to know in what particular version a, a feature got implemented, you can go hit that up. Uh, if it says like M something, that means like version. So if you see like M13, it means it came in in version 13. Um, HTML5 rocks. It's probably my favorite site to go for like cutting edge, like hey, how does something work? Um, it's written mostly by the Chrome DevRel team, uh, which I'm part of, but there's also other folks. So if you're working on something cool and you've got a really neat article that you want to go and publish, maybe you're, you're working on like some new storage mechanism, we're happy to take those things. So just reach out to us and, and it's a good resource. There's tutorials, there's all kinds of good stuff there. Um, the other good one that I would recommend is Can I Use, right? Because Can I Use, if you've not looked at it before, it basically will tell you what is supported across what browsers going all the way back to the last three or four versions of all of the modern browsers, or of all brow of all reasonable browsers, I think is the best way to describe it. Right, it covers IE, Firefox, Chrome, Opera, Safari, I think that's all of them, right? So it's not gonna cover some of the, the real time, it's not gonna cover MaxFun, right? But that's built on something else. Um, so with that, uh, I'll open it up to questions. I did go and, and sure I added this, but realistically, I think <laughs> the much more fun part is this is all HTML5. So you can just go and, and look at all these things. You want to try some of these examples in, in your browser, you can just go and hit these guys up. Um, I'll get out of that so you can actually get the, the slides uh, URL there. I'll also tweet that. I'm Pete L E um, and you can you can find me, I'll tweet it after after the event. So thanks guys. Yeah, we got a question. All right. um, hi guys, uh, my name is Nick. I started a company in New York called ZocDoc. Uh, and we are hiring, so if any of you guys want to, are interested in anything like this, uh, you know, coming and working on some of these new stuff, uh, come talk to me and have a beer with me. So are uh, the times, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, okay. so yeah, that, that was, no, I actually had a question though, too. <laughs> that was uh, just a shameless plug. Um, so, coffee script, uh, a lot of my guys, uh, are already like playing with it and, and uh, experimenting with it and everyone thinks it all, it's awesome and, and, it, and it totally is. Um, I guess my one concern is if, uh, if, if JavaScript starts implementing all of these features, then will CoffeeScript become an orphaned language? An orphaned language, I hope not. Um, one of the fun things about it is that uh, you can, you know, a lot of the features are both being prototyped in the next version of JavaScript. They keep changing them, right? So, ES, ES4 becomes ES5, becomes Harmony, becomes JS next, or whatever it is now. But, um, so not only are we starting to sort of converge on some of the same ideas, a lot of the things that are in CoffeeScript now are getting fed back into that standards process. Um, so that's sort of the optimistic answer, is that hopefully they're moving in the same direction and we can start using the same features that are actually implemented natively. So for example, CoffeeScript's bound function literals will use the native function bind implementation if it's available, and if it's not, then they polyfill it in with a custom definition. Um, the more pessimistic answer is that, you know, for people who actually have to support all the other browsers that exist, you know, that's never going to be the case, right? Microsoft has said that IE9 is never going to happen on XP. So as long as XP exists, we are never going to have, um, you know, JavaScript that works everywhere. And when I say never, maybe that means five years, but still, there's going to be a long time where we can't actually use all these things everywhere. So it's still going to be a good idea to um, compile stuff down into polyfills that will sort of fill those holes. And I, I just add to that. I would hope that as that stuff gets imported into JavaScript in the future, there's more things that as developers we want and you guys experiment with. And so there's going to be lots of new opportunities for that to keep going. I would hope. Um, to what extent, if at all, is CoffeeScript um, semantic and syntactic feature, features set based on Scala? Things like uh, removing keywords like return and var and curly braces and things like that. I think that there's a lot of, uh, what's the right word? Homologous evolution going on here, is that the one? Um, where we're sort of converging on the same um, things from different endpoints. I've actually never really looked at Scala too much except for, you know, cursory glances, so it's not a direct inspiration. Version evolution. 
but conversion, there we go. That's the one I'm looking for. Um, so yeah, Scala, not, not at all directly, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, but all of these sort of dynamic languages exploring the same area in terms, of, in terms of what you can get away with, in terms of leaving out sort of the baggage that <coughs> static typing has grown over the years. You know, if you actually have dynamic language, what does that mean? If you try to push that towards the limit of, of as expressive and dynamic as possible and as few um, compile time constraints about what you're trying to say. So to uh, mix it up for a sec, I've got a quick uh, question for Pete that I was curious about. With the uh, typed arrays, um, I don't know if you played around with them much, but um, I'm curious because one of the things that can be frustrating about JavaScript is that every number is a floating point number. It's every number is a double. So when you're doing math with a typed array where it's actually an int, are you converting to a double and back every time you access an element? Um, so I don't know for sure. I would assume that we're, we're actually being pretty smart about that because one of the things of, of typed arrays is we, uh, we do try and be really smart about what they are, how they're getting used, and try and make them as efficient as possible. So I would assume not, but I'm not positive on that. I'll get an answer for you though. All right. I, I asked, sorry, we got uh, so I had a question for Pete. Um, so the, with the microphone thing where it, it takes your voice and magically transcribes it, I was wondering who's doing the transcribing um, and who's paying for it. And, and then also, I think the natural question is what happens if they don't want to anymore? Like, uh, yeah, so. Yeah. Um, so right now, it goes up to uh, the cloud. Uh, it's done on the Google services uh, somewhere up, somewhere up in, in the Google cloud, right? Um, it's basically using the exact same thing that the Android phone is using, the, that same set of, of APIs, even though we don't really, unfortunately, have visibility into it, so we can't send stuff up <coughs> after that. Um, if the user doesn't want to use it, right now I don't believe there's a setting in Chrome, but there is a, a it's listed in the privacy policy that that kind of stuff is going up. Oh, no, sorry. The Okay, yeah, so the question is, what if Google decides that they don't want to pay for it um, and they don't want to support it any longer? It's, so here, I can give you my guess on an answer. It's, it's not the corporate answer because I don't think anybody would come back and give you this line. That piece of, uh, that API is so widely used across like Android and that, I don't think it's ever going away because, like, think about it on your Android phone. You can go do that with, with voice search. I don't think it's going away. I think we'll probably see it for a long, long time. But I probably would have said that about the translation API. So, uh, <laughs> knock on wood, cross my fingers. I, I hope it sticks around, and I don't think it'll go away. If it does, it'll go away at, at the, in the browser as well. Bob Gizelter, the question about the typed arrays, I just, since you can't possibly get a valid result by converting to float, doing the math, and converting back, yeah. the answer has to be yes. If it isn't, it is broken. I mean, severely hosed. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do much processing. I, 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 I agree that it would be a problem, but at the same time, if you pull out a value from a typed array and pass it to another function, then what, what is it going to be? I, I, right. I agree with you, but my comment was an advisory. Right? <laughs> Great. <laughs> if I'm going to do image processing with that, it yeah. better, it better behave be. correctly. Yep. And to, to follow up with the, uh, with the Google Cloud, um, so if it's actually a standard um, attribute on an input element, then does that mean when Microsoft implements it in their browser, they're also going to send stuff up to Google Cloud, or will they send it up to Microsoft Cloud? <laughs> I'm not going to get it. Well, so at, at that point, like, every browser vendor can do it however they want, right? Like, I, Microsoft has similar services because they have the same set of features for their phone, so they'll probably use their own. Opera, on the other hand, doesn't have the resources to go and build that speech recognition stuff. So they may end up implementing it and using something like, you know, either the Google Cloud or maybe they'll use Microsoft's or maybe they'll go find some third party. So it's really up to the browser vendor. Transcription results may vary. Exactly. Transcription <laughs> results may vary and, and consult your doctor for use. Um, Joe Hutner, AppNexus. Uh, I know Apple's made huge bets against Flash and uh, Google not so much, and Steve Jobs came up with that essay thoughts on Flash five years ago or whatever. 
What are your guys' thoughts on Flash at this point in time moving forward? Is it, is it just dead or don't learn it or what? Um, so what's been great with HTML5 is we really get to the point where we can write as rich, if not richer, applications than what we previously saw in Flash. Obviously, Flash is still widely used. Can you hear me? No. Yeah, turn that sucker on. Hello. There we go. Left foot. Um, yeah, so of course, Flash is widely deployed. Uh, Microsoft have Silverlight and that kind of stuff. So if it's still in environments where you're dealing with older browsers, uh, they're still potentially good options, although you could also look at Chrome Frame. Uh, given this kind of plug-in environment for developing rich applications. So as for whether they're effectively dead, you probably have to ask them. But for whether we still need them as developers, is less the case. Yeah, I, I think Flash is still a valid option in some cases. And I think Flash will always do some things really well that HTML5 just doesn't do. And I'll say three letters, and please don't hit me with the Nerf bat, but DRM is one of them, right? Like. Can you imagine a big movie house putting their videos online as MP4s or, or some other similar formatted video? You just, they're not gonna do it, right? So Flash is one way that they can go and DRM their content. It does provide a reasonable experience there. Um, Flash, I think, also does a couple other things that they may be able to, because they are doing certain sets of implementation, they're the only ones who are doing it and that kind of thing, they'll be able to try and push certain things that, you know, they have, that HTML5, because it's done in consensus across multiple browsers and implemented you know, not quite as quickly, will take a little longer to get out there. But I think, and we're all here because we love the open web. So for us, I think really the cool thing is, HTML5 is really about the open web and, and it does a lot of cool stuff. So if you, if you love the open web, HTML5. <laughs> well, well, let's wrap up on that one there. Um, these guys will be available if you if you want to chat with them. Like I said, we have drinks and, and some snacks and stuff outside. Um, feel free to stop by and chat with these guys or with Andre, anybody here wearing one of the time shirts. If you have questions, do you have any from Andre? You think said wrap up. Flash is dead to me. <laughs> 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 <laughs>